I want to thank uh, thank you for the in, uh, the uh, introduction, Paulus, and I want to thank the Simons Foundation for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I also want to thank you all for coming in on such a beautiful afternoon. Uh, as a resident of New Jersey for 10 years, I know how powerful the draw is of the first spring day where it tops 80 degrees. Um, as a resident of Miami, uh, that's our everyday weather, but uh, I know how, uh, how uh, unique it is for you guys here. What I wanted to talk to you today about is uh, climate feedbacks and the role they play in determining both the amplitude and impact of, of global warming, as well as, as their role in, in influencing the uncertainty in future uh, projections of climate change. And I think to help frame uh, this discussion and, and motivate some of the, uh, uh, the results that I'm going to show you, I thought I would highlight a recent article that came out in The Economist, and it touches on a subject that's been circulating uh, among the climate blogs and within the, the climate community for a while now. And it has to deal with uh, recent temperature changes and an apparent uh, uh, contradiction with, uh, between what's actually observed in the temperature record over the last 10 to 15 years or so with what climate models are projecting should have occurred. And this is a sort of a, a key figure from this, uh, from this paper and from this discussion. And it's uh, referring to what some people have, have called a global warming hiatus, which is if you look at the, the temperature change over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so, you see it's remained fairly flat, even though CO2, roughly 25% of the CO2 that humans have added to the atmosphere have occurred since the year 2000. And so this uh, heavy line here represents the observed temperature, global mean temperature anomalies going back to 1950. And these shaded regions here represent model projections, with the, the light shading represent the, uh, the 5 to 95 percent. And the point here is that the temperature change now is, is sort of on the verge of falling outside that envelope of model projections. And people are asking, why is that? What does that mean? And there are a number of possible explanations for this. Um, one could be that the, the forcing, the increases in CO2 or changes in aerosol concentrations, or other changes in greenhouse gases that were prescribing to these models uh, is not accurate. Uh, another possible explanation is that uh, the natural variability of the climate system uh, is actually being underpredicted in these models. In other words, this shaded region should be much larger uh, than what's actually shown there, and the models might lie closer to the middle of that rather than on the, the lower bound of that. It could also be that the warming that's occurring is occurring at depths in the oceans that are so deep that we're not actually measuring them. Um, and so it could be that the, the planet is warming, it's just not reflected in the surface temperature record or in the near surface ocean record, but it's actually occurring at deeper levels in the ocean. And the last possible explanation, and one that this article was, was sort of written about, and one that I'm going to try to uh, discuss this afternoon, is that the climate models may be too sensitive. Okay. So what do we mean by climate models being too sensitive? As a member of the climate modeling community, I can certainly tell you that climate modelers have been known at times to be too sensitive. Um, <laughs> It's a rather disturbing animation there, um, but somehow, I, uh, for some reason, I can't stop watching it. Whenever I... <laughs> uh, but this is not what we're referring to. We're not referring to the climate modelers are too sensitive. Uh, some of us have been accused of that. Um, we're actually saying that. All right, oh, now we're stuck with this. Okay, we're actually saying that the response of the climate system to a given increase in CO2 is is too large in these models compared to what it actually should be. And to understand the mechanisms that control this climate sensitivity, we need to uh, look at the, exactly how the system responds to an increase in CO2. And that's what this little uh, diagram is intended to show. So uh, when the Earth is in equilibrium, what we say we have an equal amount of energy coming in at the top of the atmosphere, in this case 240 watts per square meter of sunlight, and we have the same amount of energy being emitted back out to space, 240 watts per square meter of uh, radiation at infrared wavelengths. When that happens, we get uh, a temperature, a uh, global mean temperature of about 287 Kelvin or, or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And this temperature is maintained by two sources of energy, the sunlight 
and back radiation from the atmosphere that's representative uh, of the greenhouse effect. Now what happens when you increase CO2, let's say if we were to instantaneously double CO2, that CO2 absorbs infrared radiation that's being emitted by the surface and therefore reduces the amount of energy emitted to space by about 4 watts per square meter. So now we're no longer in equilibrium. We have more energy coming in than going out. We have more energy coming into the system than going out. The temperature has to increase. So the surface temperature warms and any object with the temperature emits radiation, and the amount of energy it emits increases as the temperature increases. So as the temperature increases, we emit more energy back out to space, and we eventually reestablish another equilibrium. We're back to 240 watts per square meter. So what determines the sensitivity of the climate system, how much that global mean temperature increases, depends on how efficiently the Earth can radiate energy back out to space for a given increase in temperature. And so that's what the problem boils down to, right? When you're predicting climate sensitivity, you need to predict how efficiently the Earth can radiate energy back to space, reestablish that equilibrium. Okay, so we can take a very simple look at this, and we can write this with, with a very simple equation. If we have the change in global mean temperature, delta T sub s, and we have a radiative forcing of 4 watts that results from the doubling of CO2, we can express uh, this sensitivity in terms of what, what are known as, as climate, uh, climate feedback parameter, or lambda. And this climate feedback parameter determines the efficiency, or defines the efficiency at which the climate system can reestablish this radiative equilibrium. How efficiently it radiates energy for a given increase in surface temperature. And so the simplest scenario is to let the, the radiation that's emitted at the top of the atmosphere be simply a function of temperature. We can just model radi outgoing radiation as a Planck function. So if the outgoing radiation is equal to sigma t to the fourth, then this efficiency, this climate feedback parameter, we get a value of uh, 4 watts per square meter. You said t to the fourth, but it's t to the cube there. Uh, well, I'm taking the derivative of it here with respect to temperature oh, okay. for the climate I feedback parameter. Team. So the four. Uh, comes down and we get, and if you put in the numbers there, the stefan boltzmann constant and the temperature for the, of the global mean uh, black body temperature of the planet, you get an efficiency of about 4 watts per square meter. Okay. So this says the Earth, if the only thing that changes is temperature, the Earth could reestablish equilibrium at an efficiency of about 4 watts for every 1 degree that you increase the temperature. So here are climate model predictions of the change in global mean temperature uh, when we increase CO2. And so what happens in these simulations is we're increasing CO2 out to the year about 2100, and then we're holding CO2 constant, and the climate models are slowly reestablishing equilibrium. And this is equivalent to roughly a doubling of CO2 here. And so what we see from this simple expectation of, of only temperature changing, we would expect an increase in global mean temperature of about a degree. So that would be the direct response to just the, the increase in CO2, and we allowed the, the, the planet to warm up in response to that. But these climate models all predict much larger increases in temperature, anywhere from 2 degrees to 4 degrees increase in global temperature. And the reason for this is because there are other things changing. This very simple assumption that the radiation was only a function of temperature uh, is, is really overly simplistic. The flow of radiation at the atmosphere depends on, on many other variables besides just temperature. Uh, there's changes in water vapor content. Water vapor is a very important greenhouse gas, very powerful greenhouse gas. So as the temperature changes, water vapor also changes. Uh, the coverage of snow and ice changes, and that affects the amount of sunlight absorbed. So there's another a, a number of, of several uh, other variables that change in response to an increase in temperature. And these other variables, we call these feedbacks. And so if we account for how changes in these other variables affect the flow of radiation, then we have to expand this climate feedback parameter to allow for changes in, in several other variables, which is water vapor and clouds and surface albedo from snow and ice coverage. And there's a simple part to these, which is simply how does the radiation it itself affected by a change in water vapor or cloud cover or surface albedo? That's fairly straightforward to compute. That just involves a, a radiative transfer model. Right? And, and those are fairly straightforward and well understood. 
the more difficult part is actually predicting how much water vapor or how much cloud cover will change in response to a change in surface temperature. And that's where we need these more sophisticated climate models. Okay. That's the role of climate models, is to really tell us how much does these terms in blue change. Now, uh, we've uh, computed these things on a number of different models, and there's some of these, these feedback parameters, these other changes that are uh, fairly well understood and some that are less well understood. And what I've put up here are just typical values for each of these quantities, just to give you some idea of what their magnitudes are. So if we have uh, the temperature response from, from Planck rated of damping of, of about 4 watts per square meter, as we warm the planet, the concentrations of water vapor increase, and that reduces the efficiency at which the Earth can restore that equilibrium by about 1.5 watts. Surface albedo also reduces that inefficiency as the planet warms, snow and ice cover melts, and that allows for an increase in the sunlight uh, being absorbed. And the end result is when you add these quantities together, we reduce this uh, efficiency from about 4 watts per square meter to the range of 1 to 2 watts per square meter. And so that gives us a climate sensitivity, meaning a change in global mean temperature that results from a doubling of CO2 that ranges anywhere from about 2 to 4 degrees in current models. And the arguments being made in looking at uh, this global warming hiatus and how it's uh, uh, dipping outside the range of model projections is that the climate sensitivity is actually may lie somewhere below that. And there are a number of studies suggesting that the climate sensitivity may be even below two degrees in the, in the range of a degree and a half to two degrees. Okay, so. But does uh, that mean it would eventually get there or just not adjusting as quickly? Or. Uh, it would mean. Uh, you wouldn't need as much warming in order to reestablish that equilibrium. So if you use this idealized scenario of doubling the concentration of CO2, if the climate sensitivity is one and a half degrees, what we're saying is that the planet would only have to warm by one and a half degrees in order to reestablish that equilibrium. But excuse me, may I ask the same question in a slightly different way? Um, these calculations uh, tell you the final temperature after you've doubled let's say the CO2 concentration, and then let the system establish a new equilibrium. Right. However, as far as I understand it, between 2005 and now, the rate at which we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere hasn't stopped. We're still adding more. Right. So why is this relevant to that hiatus? So uh, it, there, there's two things that, to be addressed here. One is that we use this uh, metric of, cl of climate sensitivity, the response to the doubling of CO2, as one way of intercomparing models. And, and, and establishing, if we were to do it, this very idealized experiment of increasing CO2 and then holding it constant again, how much warming would it take to reestablish that equilibrium and energy flow at the top of the atmosphere? There's another issue that makes it more complicated is that what we really experience is really not a, a, an equilibrium response, but we experience this transient response where the climate is changing as uh, the greenhouse gases are also increasing. And it's that transient response that's actually being depicted in this. In this uh, comparison here. So this is the model projections in that shaded region are reflecting the expected change in temperature while CO2 is increasing under a realistic uh, emission scenario for the near future. And a higher climate sensitivity uh, leads to a larger temperature response even in the near term, not just at the equilibrium value. But there are other factors that go into influence. Question, is this working? I don't think so. Um, the, you haven't mentioned Milankovitch cycles. My understanding is that the world should be cooling. We ought to be having another ice age because of the juxtaposition of the Earth and the Sun and so on. Right. Uh, the changes in radiation that occur with those Milankovitch cycles are on such a much longer time scale that over the period shown here, they're effectively zero. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry to have to keep going past that. <laughs> okay. 
So uh, equations are one way of illustrating this concept of feedbacks and how they amplify the response. But uh, the concept of feedbacks occurs in all walks of life. It's not unique to the climate system. And uh, so I have an example, uh, and I think pictures are a good way to illustrate the, the potential importance of feedbacks in, in any kind of system. So in my house, I have uh, three daughters. And for the sake of discussion, these will be the forcing agents in my household. And for the most part, they're well-behaved children, right? You know, they, uh, they'll, you know, not perfectly behave, but to the extent that their actions cause a disruption to the household are fairly minimal. I also happen to have a feedback in the household, and her name is Nutmeg. Now, in isolation, Nutmeg is, is a pretty well-behaved dog as well. It's the combination of a strong positive feedback with the forcing agents that result in, in much larger and dramatic changes than either one would occur individually. <laughs> and so to give you just an example of this, one particular example. So here's uh, my kitchen after my daughters have cleaned it up. And you know they've done a fairly good job. The floors are clean, the table's clean, countertops are clean. And for the most part, they've left it in the same way that they found it, almost. There's you know, a very small perturbation here, and that perturbation is that they left the wastebacks slightly <laughs> ajar, which in and of itself would not result in any dramatic changes. But in the presence of a, a strong positive feedback like nutmeg, it results in a much larger mess for me to clean up when I come home. And so the same thing happens with the climate system, that the, the temperature response that's due to the forcing itself, the increase in CO2, is actually very modest and not something that we would be concerned about. We should expect from the direct effect of CO2 would lead to a warming of about a degree. But it turns out we have these other strong positive uh, feedbacks that amplify the response. And two of the more important ones are water vapor and changes in snow and ice cover, and I'll discuss all these in detail in a minute. These themselves are fairly consistent across models, and their combination increases that temperature from about one degree to an excess of two degrees. Then we have one more feedback mechanism, which are the changes in clouds, which are not consistent across models. They're highly variable. Um, but they also tend to be an amplifying feedback, and so that they further increase the temperature change. And so there's two points to make with this. One are that most of the warming that we will realize from an increase in CO2, as projected by current models, comes not from the forcing itself, but from these amplifying feedbacks. The other thing is that virtually all of the uncertainty in projecting how much warming we'll get is not from the forcing, but comes from these feedbacks. Um, so what I want to do is to sort of, to, again, help frame this within context of that, that article in The Economist, is to note that if we are to actually have an equilibrium sensitivity, and you see when we combine all these feedbacks now, we have a much better explanation for why the equilibrium temperature response in these model projections is in the 2 to 4 degree range rather than uh, the 1 degree range. The other point I want to make, getting back to that Economist article, is that if some of these studies are true, that the real climate sensitivity is actually less than 2 degrees Kelvin, that we, will, we would actually have to have a negative feedback from clouds, rather than a positive feedback, which is something that currently models predict. And so I'm going to use that to try to frame some of uh, the discussion about uh, cloud feedback in particular. So to start out with, uh, you know, the simplest of these feedbacks uh, is snow and and ice feedback. And uh, this is sort of very intuitive, uh, I think, to most people. Here's a, a, a box diagram illustrating how this feedback works. If you have an increase in temperature, for example, that increase in temperature leads to a reduction in snow and ice cover. When it gets warmer, things melt. And less snow and ice cover leads to an increase in absorbed sunlight. And, so, and as you increase the amount of sunlight being absorbed, you further warm the temperature. So that cycle between these mechanisms represents a positive feedback. And there's you know, very clear observational evidence that this mechanism is working. So here's a comparison of the observed changes in Arctic sea ice coverage over the last uh, 50 years or so compared to model projections. And you see in this case, models are actually underestimating the response 
of, uh, of uh, sea ice cover in the Arctic to increasing greenhouse gases. And so it, this mechanism of snow and ice albedo feedback is, is very clearly operating in the current climate system, and I don't think that's no surprise. Again, as the climate warms, things melt. Um, but the area covered by the, the polar regions are, are fairly limited, right? And so the magnitude of this feedback is, is relatively small compared to like water vapor feedback. Typically in, in those numbers I put up, water vapor feedback is about three times as powerful as uh, snow and ice uh, feedback in current climate models. And a lot of that has to do with the limited area coverage of snow and ice cover. Locally, these changes are very important and very dramatic in the, Ar in the Arctic. But on, in terms of the global scale energy budget, uh, they're uh, sort of a, a smaller magnitude feedback. So if snow and ice beetle feedback was to be a breed of dog, what kind of dog would it be? I came up with a Yorkshire Terrier, right? It's fairly simple and small and easy to handle. Um, its bark is worse than its bite, for the most part, but you always know it's there, okay? <laughs> um, a much more important and, and more powerful feedback comes from water vapor. And this works, uh, again, a, a, a wire diagram shown here. Uh, as you increase surface temperature, there's an increase in water vapor in the atmosphere. Right? And as a resident of Miami, I can tell you it was very humid there, and, and that's in part due to the very warm temperatures. Uh, water vapor is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So as you increase the amount of water vapor, you get a stronger greenhouse effect. The stronger greenhouse effect reinforces the temperature. And so this is a very powerful and very, in all climate models, this represents uh, the strongest known feedback mechanism. Um, and it's, this is a, a feedback mechanism that's uh, very clear to see in the observations as well. And you can just look at the distribution of these quantities and see uh, this, this mechanism in operation. So what I've shown here are just three maps of the annual average distribution of ocean surface temperature, atmospheric water vapor, and greenhouse effect. And you can clearly see that regions that have, in the tropics with the warmer ocean temperatures, correspond to regions that have higher uh, water vapor concentrations. Higher water vapor concentrations are associated with a stronger greenhouse effect. And that stronger greenhouse effect, in turn, reinforces the warmer temperatures of the tropics. So this is a, a very clear and very simple mechanism. Um, despite that, this, this feedback has a, has a bit of a history in terms of its uncertainty. And to illustrate that, what I've shown here are uh, what essentially are the take-home points of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its assessments of water vapor feedback. And these reports uh, are periodic assessments. They come out every six or seven years or so. And what I've listed here are just the sort of the bullet summaries regarding water vapor feedback from these reports. And you, if you look, uh, if you go back to 1990, uh, it seemed like the, you know, the, the issue was settled with regard to water vapor feedback. But this was uh, uh, the best understood feedback, and it was intuitively easy to understand, much like we saw in, in those earlier diagrams. Um, we then went through a period where there is a great deal of debate within the scientific community about uh, how well did we actually understand this feedback and how well was it observed. And we ultimately ended up sort of back where we started, at least uh, in the most recent report in 2007, where it concluded that observational modeling evidence showed strong support for a, uh, a positive and, and strong water vapor feedback. And this, this confidence reflects two things, both the simplicity with which water vapor operates uh, and that we see in the observations, as well as the, the consistency between the observations and, and the model projections. And what I've shown here is just a comparison of the global water vapor anomalies, um, which are shown here in blue. These represent global average ocean-only water vapor anomalies in the atmosphere. Uh, we have observations starting in the late 1980s. And you can see there's a lot of uh, variability and fluctuations in these, as well as a sort of a longer term increase here. And the gray regions represent model simulations. And we take a, a climate model, give it the observed sea surface temperatures, and, and look at what the water vapor changes are predicted in that model. 
And you can see that the climate models closely reproduce what the observed changes are. And the reason for that is that we've given models a big part of the answer here, which is what the temperature is. The temperature anomalies, the ocean temperature anomalies, the sea surface temperature anomalies, are shown in green here. And you can see that there's you know, a very simple and, and quite a powerful relationship between the water vapor anomalies and the temperature anomalies. Warmer atmosphere is uh, on, on sort of any time scale here is associated with a, a more humid atmosphere. And so as the atmosphere warms, uh, there's an increase in the amount of water vapor and a stronger greenhouse effect. And it's this feedback mechanism that represents a, a very powerful and important mechanism in climate models. <coughs> and so if I were to characterize water vapor feedback as a, as a breed of dog, this is a very predictable, a very powerful, a very robust feedback mechanism. And you know, it's, it's one that every model has, and they're all pretty much the same. Right? Um, that brings us to our last feedback mechanism, which is cloud feedback. And cloud feedback is both highly uncertain uh, and, and uh, highly variable from model to model. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, part of the reason is we also we lack a, a simple physical explanation. Both ice albedo and water vapor feedback had a very simple basis for, uh, for how their changes would occur. That's not the case for clouds. For example, if we have a change in surface temperature, it's not immediately obvious how cloud cover would change. Would cloud cover increase, would cloud cover decrease, or how would the cloud properties change? Those aren't immediately obvious. So even starting out this connection, we don't know what sort of relationship to expect uh, between temperature and cloud cover. Now even if we could uh, predict how the cloud cover would change in response to a change in temperature, it has two competing effects. Clouds, if you increase cloud cover, that would increase the amount of sunlight reflected back to space, which would tend to decrease the temperature. So this would represent a negative feedback. On the other hand, clouds also absorb infrared radiation. So if you increase cloud cover, that would enhance the greenhouse effect, which would increase surface temperature. Here are two climate models that have very different climate sensitivities. Uh, on the top, we have the GFDL model which is a model that's developed down in Princeton, New Jersey. And what this shows is that it has a very high climate sensitivity, about four degrees increase in global mean temperature for doubling the CO2. And part of the reason it has such a high climate sensitivity is that as the climate warms, it loses a lot of low cloud cover, and that's what's shown here. So these low clouds are very effective at, re at reflecting sunlight back to space, including the planet. So as we reduce the low cloud cover, we get a much warmer uh, surface temperature. We have another model, which also happens to be one of the other major US climate models, uh, which was the NCAR model from Boulder, Colorado, from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. This model has a very low climate sensitivity. The main reason this model has a very low climate sensitivity is that as it warms from increasing CO2, it increases the amount of low cloud cover, therefore increasing the amount of sunlight reflected back to space. Now, it turns out that uh, if you make small changes to these models in their parameterizations of how they calculate uh, 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 things, it turns out not, not to be even related to, directly related to cloud cover itself. Um, this shows two different versions of each of these models. And there are slightly different changes in the physical parameterizations used to represent things like atmospheric convection. But what happens when you make these changes in the model, they now become much more consistent in terms of their changes in, or their expected climate sensitivities. Um, and that main, the main reason why their climate sensitivities change so dramatically is that their low cloud feedback change very dramatically. Okay. And this is not uncommon. It's very difficult for us to represent the, all the physical processes that go in determining cloud formation in these models because their resolution is so coarse. And as we parameterize these processes, the response of clouds to details of how they're represented is very sensitive. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of breed of dog cloud feedback should be. Uh, I came up with cat dog, right? 
It's uh, very confusing, very hard to predict. And if you've ever watched this cartoon, it's, it's actually very almost painful to watch. <laughs> but if you look hard enough, uh, you might hope that you could actually look into the data and actually find a cat dog, right? And so what I'm going to talk about now are, are attempts to try to place some constraints, particularly on low cloud feedback. Because it, well, it's not just those two models that have differences in how they project changes in low cloud feedback. Um, but this is actually a common trait uh, across uh, almost all current climate models, that the main reason their climate sensitivity differs is because they project different changes in low stratocumulus clouds that are found in these parts of the world. Uncertainty in simulating these clouds is responsible for about two-thirds of the uncertainty in cloud feedback in current <coughs> climate models. So if we want to make progress, at least on resolving why different climate models uh, predict different climate sensitivities, it's these clouds uh, that are most responsible for that difference. And so to try to look into this, uh, a PhD student at University of Miami, Katinka Belomo, has done an analysis of long-term changes in the cloud cover and what their implications are for cloud feedback. And here's just a couple of figures uh, from this paper that I wanted to highlight. And uh, these, these pictures may be difficult to read, but what's shown here are the observational estimates of cloud feedback over the last 50 years or so. And these are taken from ship measurements of cloud cover changes that are then calibrated to a radiative impact using satellite observations of the radiative impact of clouds. And the point here is that if you look at the changes in cloud cover over this period and what their feedback would be, you see that there is large areas of positive feedback uh, particularly in some of these marine stratocumulus regions. And what she's done is to highlight three regions here with these boxes that sort of focus on these main areas of uncertainty. And on the right-hand side are the corresponding changes uh, from climate models. Okay. Now, these re this region is fairly limited because we don't have good uh, ship observations. We don't have enough ship observations in many of these other regions. So that's why the domain is so much smaller here for the observations. But one of the points I want to make, there may be some similarity here uh, between uh, the color shading, but a point you know, I, I want to make is that the, the uh, color bar here is about an order of magnitude larger for the observations. This color bar is cut off on the bottom here, but this is minus 2.5, and this is minus 18. So the colors are similar, but that's because she's changed the shading here. The, the changes here are about an order of magnitude larger in the observations than in the model. And if you look at these marine stratocumulus regions in particular, what, and compare them, uh, the observed estimates of cloud feedback for these three different regions, which are shown by these three different colors here, and compare those to this range of different models, all with widely varying cloud feedbacks, what you see is that uh, the observations suggest a, a substantially stronger feedback from low clouds than what any of the models are predicting for these regions. And this is not the only study to suggest this. There's been you know, other studies that have at least hinted at this. Now, this is a very difficult problem to try to get observational estimates of cloud feedback. We don't have very good records of cloud cover. And for long-term records, ship observations are about the only thing we have. We have satellite records that go back uh, a little over two decades. But for trends over much longer periods, like 50 decades, we really have to rely on surface observations. And surface observations come with their limitations. <coughs> but to the extent that we can measure this, um, if anything, this analysis suggests that the models are underestimating the amplifying effect of low clouds, not overestimating it. So if we come back to this original article from uh, The Economist and ask, you know, are models too sensitive here? Is the reason that this temperature curve 
seems to be falling outside the range of model predictions. Is that because the model sensitivities are too high? In order for that to be the case, uh, one of these feedback mechanisms would have to be wrong, right? Now, there, there's, I think, sort of uh, <coughs> almost unequivocal evidence on water vapor feedback, that the models have that right. It's a very simple mechanism. We have good observations of it. So I think it's very unlikely that water vapor feedback is wrong by any substantial amount. Ice albedo feedback is happening. Uh, it's small, but it's, it's very clearly positive, right? And, and it's, I think, very unlikely, again, if anything, models are likely to be underestimating the impact of that, especially in the, in the uh, Arctic sea ice regions. So that would leave clouds as sort of the only possible explanation to, that we could get a low climate sensitivity out of the real world is much lower than what models are projecting. And um, while that's possible, I think, all the observational evidence that we have, as limited as it is, suggests the opposite. That, in fact, models are underestimating the amplifying effects of cloud cover. And it's not just this one study from uh, Katinka, but there are a handful of other studies that have suggested it this. So I think that leaves us uh, perhaps looking uh, at other mechanisms to try to understand this. I, you know, I think it's sure it's possible that models could be overestimating the sensitivity and that there could be a, a substantial negative feedback from clouds that we just haven't uncovered in the observational record yet. Um, but there's certainly no evidence of that yet. And what evidence we do have you know, suggests the opposite. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop and take questions.